The consultation session is on OECD's anti-corruption and integrity guidelines. And the moderator for this session is Mr. Hans Christiansen, head of OECD Working Party on State Ownership and Privatization Practices Secretariat. And we also have two eminent speakers with him. Uh, Dr. Gambhir Bhatta, Advisor, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, Head Knowledge Sharing and Service Center, ADB. And we also have Dr. Dambar Singh Kakra, uh, Director of Corporate Governance and Performance Management Department, Drug Holding and Investment, Bhutan. I request Mr. Hans to take over the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the Welcome to this last session. Kind of, I'm sure that uh, you are all tired after one and a half very intensive days, uh, but let's try to make it brisk and interesting. Uh, uh, we are going to talk indeed about uh, a topic that has been meandering in and out of the last two sessions, namely the fight against corrupt practices in state-owned enterprises. And the context, as our master of ceremony just said, is um, uh, the fact that the OECD is in the process of developing uh, guidelines in this area and uh, or I should say in the process we are about to begin the process which makes this uh, network meeting extraordinarily timely in terms of um, making an Asian early input to influence the directions of this work. Uh, um, on the on the issue, just uh, just um, just an aside remark, but uh, on the issue of anti-corruption in state-owned enterprises, actually, I have personally spent a lot of time in South America, where uh, recently, where the issue of anti-corruption state-owned enterprises has really uh, figured centrally because of some political scandals. You have all read about them in the newspapers, and um, and. Uh, I have to say that in uh, and, and, and now I'm responding a little bit to the Chinese uh, delegate in the previous channel uh, uh, panel, sorry, because uh, a remark that I heard over and over in Latin America was that, okay, we have taken note of the fact that the OECD recommends kind of a high degree of autonomy to these SOEs and uh, their boards, but it tends to get out of hand, and uh, we do need these state auditors and state controllers to keep a tight grip and some internal control bodies in the SOEs. Uh, and if uh, you substitute for the state auditors the CPC, I'm not sure that this uh, unique Chinese model is all that different from what we um, have uh, heard in Latin America. So, so I do actually see a basis for continuing along those lines, but this was just um, a little remark from the OECD. Kind of, I am uh, joined here by a small but distinguished panel. I mean, we should have been three, but um, uh, there is now um, Dr. Gambia Batza, as was said, uh, he is the uh, head of knowledge sharing and service center at the Asian Development Bank, and until very recently, the chief, uh, the chief of the corporate governance thematic group. He's also a longstanding expert on state-owned enterprises and um, uh, a lecturer at the uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public uh, Policy. And uh, on my other side, uh, we have uh, Dambar Sinkaka, who is Director of Corporate Governance and Performance Management at uh, Druk, the Bhutanese holding company, PhD in uh, financial economics, and um, uh, one of the founding fathers of the Druk holding company and uh, with a background as the uh, faculty of the Royal Institute of Management. So uh, very, very in uh, experienced panelists indeed. Um, I am... Um, going to use my uh, moderator's prerogative to start by giving a s short presentation myself. I uh, do apologize if this constitutes a conflict of interest. <laughs> Further to this, uh, to this issue of, um, of the attempt to develop uh, what we have termed anti-corruption and integrity guidelines, or for short, ACI guidelines, um, this is not in any way to detract from the existing OECD guidelines on corporate governance of state-owned enterprises because, as Jess, uh, Stanislaus said uh, in the previous panel, this really uh, ends and begins, well, 
and it, it definitely begins with uh, sound ownership and corporate governance practices at the top. And uh, the guidelines are and will remain our foremost instrument in this area. And the, AC, the new ACI guidelines will serve as a complementary and supplementary um, instrument to the existing guidelines. Now, importantly, uh, as um, like the existing guidelines, the new instrument is addressed to the ownership of state-owned enterprises. It is not trying to solve the whole world situation. It is about what can government officials acting as owners of state-owned enterprises do to minimize the risk of corruption and other irregular practices in state-owned enterprises. And that is important because uh, uh, when people see our drafts, they're saying, well, yes, what about company officials, what about um, uh, the state auditors, and see, but they are ex there is, uh, it's an excellent question, but there are excellent guidance for, um, as, for companies, there are excellent guidance for state auditors, but our advice and best practices is for, um, for the state owners. And um, like the guidelines, it will be an OECD instrument, but non-binding non for both governments and individual SOEs. But uh, also, and that's important, uh, like the existing guidelines, it will, of course, uh, uh, it is one of the parameters according to which a country is reviewed if it applies to join the OECD. About, about the uh, proposed anti-corruption and integrity guidelines, and you do have a zero draft, as we call it, in front of you. It was uh, delivered to you as part of the conference package. Uh, just a word about that, because um, I urge you uh, to treat this purely for your information. It's not an OECD document. It has not been seen by any OECD body yet in an uh, official discussion. It was drafted by a colleague and myself and sent around to give our uh, member countries, our delegates, a chance to come back with first initial comments prior to the first meeting where this will be discussed by an OECD forum, our working party, and that will happen in November. But uh, during the months of September, our members have an opportunity to make first inputs and, and comment and uh, influence the direction of this instrument and uh, today you have the same opportunity. Uh, just another couple of uh, small points. Um, uh, when people say corruption they often mean bribery but when we say anti-corruption and integrity and for the purpose of this instru instrument we mean bribery, other corrupt practices i.e. Um, abuse of trusted position and breaking of laws, rule, and company in, uh, internal rules as well. Um, it is, um, as I said, uh, of course, uh, anti-corruption instruments always have um, prevention, detection, and enforcement element, and so will the ACI guidelines, but because of the focus on ownership, the main focus will be on prevention. And uh, I should finally mention, which Mathilde also did, that, um, that uh, it actually takes place with, uh, in parallel with an undertaking by the G20, who is also under the current Argentinian uh, presidency trying to develop some uh, more high-level uh, principles uh, for um, avoiding corrupt practices and state-owned enterprises. And for all we know, it could continue uh, into the G20 in, in 2019. But uh, you may wonder, why do we think there is a problem? Uh, what, 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 is it, uh, what is it we are trying to address with this? Uh, now, some of you may be aware of the OECD foreign bribery report that was released two or three years ago and which took stock of um, adjudicated cases of bribery in, in the past under these foreign bribery laws. Now, I, I, I caution you that um, this is not about corruption in the broader sense, it's purely about bribery, it's purely abroad. Um, and uh, so we are talking about a tip of a large iceberg, but what my colleagues in anti-bribery found was that no less than 27% of all bribes paid were received by uh, officials placed within SOEs. And not only that, but um, uh, more than three-fourths of the amounts involved were paid to SOE officials. Now, there's no indication that SOEs are more likely to bribe other people 
uh, if, uh, than private companies. If anything, the opposite, but there is an issue with incoming bribes. Uh, and that's where the interest of my colleagues ended, but frankly, that's where my interest started, because I wanted to know what was the characteristics of these SOEs which had gotten into this uh, trouble. And um, totally in keeping with what uh, Jess said, um, the worst cases were invariably in SOEs where the CEO uh, had been appointed directly by the president or the prime minister without any scrutiny, without any board in involvement, and, and one may then speculate that uh, this man was there to uh, for, fulfill uh, an irregular function. Uh, um, and as Mathilde also said, we then did our own study of um, of uh, state-owned enterprises, which is uh, put before you as a publication. Uh, we sampled no less than 350 SOE insiders uh, at the board level and at the managerial level in these companies, sometimes more people in one company, which was quite interesting. And um, uh, we found, as Mathilde also said, that no less than 42% of the respondents were willing to tell us that they had witnessed uh, corrupt or otherwise irregular practices in their SOEs within the last couple of years. Now, think about this. I mean, uh, they, let's face it, they have um, a strong incentive to underreport. So this 42% is too low. But uh, so there clearly is an issue to be addressed here. And uh, that is, uh, that's what this exercise is about. Uh, also, uh, what sectors were particularly affected uh, you will not be surprised to hear that this was oil and gas, mining, and the heavy, um, the heavy uh, infrastructure sectors. These are the areas where there are either valuable concessions or large public procurement contracts. And we, when we then asked, when we then asked, uh, what are the main obstacles to getting some better integrity in your company? Absolutely, at the top, the response was, we don't get enough support from the government officials that oversee our SOE. There's no interest in, 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 in cleaning our act. So the tone at the top, uh, as Jess said, and, um, and in second and third place among the obstacles came then opportunistic behavior by individuals inside the SOE, and point three, some not very functional compliance and, uh, and uh, risk management functions. The last two you might also find in the private sector, but, but as far as we are concerned, the music is really in the gray zone between the state and the enterprise. Which uh, leaves me to the proposed content of the ACI guidelines, the document which is in front of you, and we, um, we have proposed to cluster this into uh, four building blocks, as we call it. The first one is the integrity of the state. I mean, uh, point one, unless there are reasonably high standards of ethics and a commitment to fight corruption at the highest level of states, this doesn't go anywhere in the SOE uh, sector. And point two, how do you establish some ownership arrangements that are conductive to integrity? Uh, and one of these would be uh, and that is not a new recommendation from the OECD, keeping ownership away from other state functions so that, so that those who are responsible for the profitability for, of the SOEs do not get to set rules uh, of operation because that's really a catastrophic conflict of interest uh, as far as we are concerned. And uh, ownership and gov uh, governance, I mean, how do you make sure that uh, the state's intentions and wishes for the SOE are not so opaque that they serve as a smokescreen for irregular practices. <clears throat> How does the state act as an informed and active owner? I mean, making it clear, as someone also said, that there's a new sheriff in town and we now want you to clean your act. Point three, corruption prevention and detection at the SOE level. That's where it gets tricky because you know that the OECD thinks that the state should not in, be too ad hoc and interfere too much in individual SOEs. But how much can the state owners do to ensure an adequate risk management, uh, integrity mechanisms, and of course safeguard the autonomy of SOEs and the decision making bodies, and that's more within the state's direct powers because that's really about getting a board of directors that uh, feel committed to the company as well as to the owner. And uh, fourthly, the accountability of SOEs in the state. I mean, the first one is plain vanilla. I mean, how do you get objective external review of the SOEs and, uh, and the ownership function and, 
ex uh, external review here, that can both mean state auditors and independent audit firms, and as far as we are concerned, it should mean both things. Um, how do you make sure, because uh, if, if something goes wrong, how do you uh, make sure that action is taken and due process is re respected? Because let's face it, there are some politicians, maybe ministers, who stand to get embarrassed by this and who may want to interfere with the processes. And finally, um, invite the inputs of civil society, the public and the press. And, and if I'm honest with you, that's actually a South American point because whenever something happens in Latin America, it's usually in spite of the fact that the previous point is not respected and because of the fact that there is uh, great publicity uh, around uh, an evolving scandal. So uh, I'll leave it at that and uh, I, will I will turn it over to our panelists on the understanding that uh, they will share with us uh, some of their own thoughts about how to fight corrupt practices in SOEs and, and make some comments and remarks about uh, the proposed OECD uh, undertaking. Uh, yes, Cambier, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, uh, just a little bit of my own background. Um, I'm right now um, heading the Knowledge Services Center in um, ADB, but before that I used to be the chief of the governance group uh, for the bank. Uh, one large component of that was working with the, uh, on state-owned enterprise reforms, um, and I was the chair of the SOE working group for ADB. And as I mentioned yesterday, um, ADB has substantial investments in state-owned enterprises in Asia and the Pacific, um, and a large part of that related to how we looked at issues of corruption. Um, I was also um, a person in charge from ADB side for the ADB OECD Anti-Corruption Initiative, and so there's a lot of interest that we have uh, in this particular area. Um, let's look at some numbers, because the best way of actually understanding what we're talking about is to look at some evidence. And the way I think we should go about talking to governments about why they should be thinking about uh, anti-corruption, thinking about issues of integrity, thinking about reforms in SOEs is not just by saying that this is good and you know, it's good for the country to have uh, a system where we're focusing a large part on, on, on anti-corruption and so on, but actually letting them know that this is something that is much more tangible. Um, now, I mentioned yesterday about sustainable development goals. We're talking about trillions of dollars that's needed by these countries. Uh, developing countries need, by, uh, by any uh, estimates from, from UNCTAD and all that, uh, about three tri trillion dollars a year. Now, there's only so much money these countries are going to get in terms of uh, FDI, foreign direct investment. You know, countries like Cambodia and Nepal and Bhutan are not necessarily going to get foreign direct investment that is, you know, substantially higher than what it is now. There's only so much money they're going to get in ODA, official development assistance, because that's sort of more or less drying up now. These countries need to be you know, more innovative in thinking of new ways of actually raising the money. And they can make it up by, it, by finding new areas to tax, or they can, and they can make it up by looking at other areas where there's actually waste. So for example, um, there's a lot of money, OECD itself has estimated about $400 billion a year that's lost. That's lost on taxes, uh, you know, lost attributed to tax avoidance. Um, after the Panama Papers were out, of course, there's a lot of discussion about how, what countries can do to make sure that they are not losing out on the taxes. A good example is uh, based erosion profit shifting, BEPS. Uh, how you can have a company like Apple whose non-U.S. sale of, of, of its phones is actually managed out of Ireland, and they pay a minuscule amount for taxes. And the, and the entity that's losing out the most is the U.S. government, because they're not paying taxes on them. Um, there's something called automatic exchange of information that OECD and the others are working on. And this works like a charm. This is actually a way to you know, ensure that you know, you're not, you are actually paying your taxes. I'll give you my own example. I used to work in Singapore. I have an account in Singapore. Um, and I have a house in Singapore, and I get rent over there, and the rent goes to the account in Singapore, in, in Citibank. I'm a citizen of New Zealand. I have to pay taxes in New Zealand. There's an agreement between the government of Singapore and the government of New Zealand where my, my returns and my, my income in that account is automatically exchanged, automatically. Every year I have to fill out a form with Citibank saying this is who I am and this is, and this is my tax status in New Zealand. It's automatically, I mean, that data, that information goes to the IRD, the Inland Revenue Department in Wellington. 
I can't escape that. And if they find something wrong, they meaning the IRD in New Zealand find something wrong, there's something called exchange of information on request. They then call Citibank in, in Singapore and say, can you please give us a little bit more information about this person? We see uh, money going out of you know, $15,000 that went out in this, uh, this particular month. This is serious stuff. This is how countries are now beginning to understand how to actually tap into the taxes that individuals have been hiding all along. So as I said, OECD has calculated about $400, $500 billion a year that's lost. Well, I take that back, $240 billion is what it is. Um, there's also illicit financial flows from countries. Um, the World Bank had estimated about $5.6 trillion in the last 10, from 2001 to 2010. So countries are doing, you know, finding a way to actually stem that as well. Um, there's remittances, $600 billion from the, the, a year, that's what the World Bank says. A large part of that is not going through the banking system. It's going through what's called the Hundi system. So I'm here, Hans is in, in Paris. Uh, I might tell him to give some money to someone I know in Paris, and then I put, in, I put some money in his account over here, for example. It has nothing to do with the banking system. I'm just giving, or I might maybe give it to his relative. And so they're not able to tax that remittance. Um, procurement reform. Um, I did a big loan in Bangladesh when I first joined the bank on good governance, and we're looking at issues of how to minimize corruption. And at that time, DFID, the Department for International Development in the UK, had actually done a study. At that time, public sector procurement in Bangladesh was $10 billion a year, just public sector, of which about 30% was wasted, either corrupt, in corruption or mismanagement. 30% of $10 billion is $3 billion a year, even if it is half of that. Even if it is 10% of that, the country is losing a lot of money. So the argument we're making to our countries is don't just think of it as, oh, you need to do SOE reforms because it's good. We think of saying do SOE reforms because there is money to be made out of this. And on SOEs alone, there's a, there's a state-owned enterprise in Nepal called the Nepal Electricity Authority, which has total control over everything in the electricity sector in the country, everything generation, transmission, billing, you name it. One of only two state-owned enterprises in Nepal that year in, year out is in a loss. $70 million a year for a country like Nepal. $70 million of losses that this, that this state-owned enterprise is making, and the government does nothing to reform it. It has done nothing yet. So we're saying to countries like Nepal, if you want to have SOE reforms done, Think about it also in terms of what it could do for purposes of revenue generation. Maybe that might get them more excited. So when I was looking at the, the anti-corruption integrity guidelines of looking at SOE reforms, all that, we thought maybe one of the angles to take would be to go to them and say, you know what, this is good, but it's also beneficial for you for many reasons. Now I want to take it, you know, take the, the, the discussion from there. Um, the OECD itself has said there are different ways in which we can actually see the sources of increased corruption in, in, in SOEs, and these are stra straightforward standard things. Uh, Hans has talked about the extractive industries being one of the more um, uh, you know, high-profile ones. Uh, because these are you know, entities that are owned by governments, and governments by their very nature have a tendency to control things because that's where they get their, you know, that's where they you know, get uh, to have uh, cronism, nepotism, that's where they get to get their you know, people that have voted for them to get jobs and so on. Um, there are weak disclosure laws, and of course there are employees that are not uniformly. So these are standard reasons that the OECD itself has said are why uh, we should be looking at you know, where, where the corruption risks are. Um, in 2015, uh, we, the ADB did a study in the Pacific, but we also included other countries as well to look at what is it that we're finding by way of state-owned enterprise reforms and what can we do about it. And, the general conclusion was that in most countries, poor SOE performance is the norm. And this is a report that's publicly available, and I would urge you to read it if you want to find out what's happening in the Pacific countries uh, and how do they compare, let's say, with Singapore and New Zealand and, and a whole lot of other countries as well. So the general conclusion of course, that because of government control, the, uh, you know, there's political interference in the, in the SOE system. Non-commercial decisions, we've talked about this yesterday a little bit about how you can have SOEs that are actually making you know, commercial decisions, giving them that space to do so. Um, political will is important, I'll come back to that because you can't be talking about anti-corruption guidelines and so on without really looking at the issue of political will. 
Um, and finally, of course, strong governance that's needed in terms of you know, moving elected officials, making sure that they're not actually in the boards of this. The general conclusion we have is that SOEs do not perform very well, largely because of corporate governance issues. Largely, there are other reasons, of course, but that's one of the main things that we found. This point about uh, hard budget constraints is also very important because SOEs do not have, they're not subject to what's called a hard budget constraint. You know, where we say the government says, right, if you're going to, well, this is the only amount of money that you're going to get. Uh, if you run into a loss or your loans go bad, then you are responsible for it. You know, governments will always come in and bail out the SOEs in case there's no incentive for management to do anything. Um, that's very, uh, you know, reform oriented. So some of the issues that we've found, subsidies and fiscal drain. So take a look at that particular institution that I mentioned, the Nepal Institute Authority. The government gives its subsidies every year, so you're losing money. The entity is not making any profit, so it's not really giving any taxes, you know, or paying any, you know, uh, there's no dividend that the state is getting in return for its equity, uh, you know, ownership over there. Um, there's cronism, there's corruption, there's mismanagement. There's no beneficial thing that you can see out of it. And services are not really being provided in a very efficient manner as well. Contingent liability is a very big issue. We haven't talked so much about it in this particular, uh, in these two days, but it's something that's really, really, really big. Uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers about two years ago did a study and said, other than natural disasters, contingent liability overhang is the most serious threat that countries face. It is no joke because every time an SOE gets a loan and a government guarantees it, it has to provision for it in the budget. Many don't, but it has to provision for it. And if the loan falls through, the government has to you know, pay up. And there's that continual liability that keeps on adding up. And it's a risk that many countries have been identified as being very seriously you know, subject to. Uh, there are unclear objectives. Uh, are there community service obligations? Is it supposed to make a profit? Is it supposed to provide uh, good services? And look, it's not just a, 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 a you know, less developed country thing, okay? Those of you that are familiar with Australia, and if there's a city called Alice Springs in the middle of, of Australia. Who, who's going to provide services in Alice Springs? Uh, plane services, for example. Which private sector company is going to go and say, I'd like to open up some services over there? The, the economic rate of return just don't match up at all. But the, the people do need you know, services. I used to lead the work, uh, ADB's work in Maldives. And you know, Maldives is like 160 islands. Some islands have 50 people. And the Minister of Finance at that time used to tell me all the time, how are you going to provide services to 50 people in an island? In an island, not even, because I used to also work in Bhutan, which is why I'm sort of familiar with Bhutan. At least in Bhutan, it's contiguous area. You could actually build a road. It costs a lot of money, but you could build a road. In Maldives, how are you going to do anything in, in an island for 50 people? But you can't, the government can't say, you know what, we don't care about the 50 people. Now, unfortunately, there was a tsunami. And at least because of the tsunami, many people said, you know what, we can't really live in this island. So they moved to a different island. And now they have a place called Hulmali, right outside Mali where they're getting more people to come in. But there are still islands that have very few people. The government has to be involved in this, which is where SOEs come in, which is where the issue of reforming the SOEs come in, and that's why this particular guidelines are very important. All right, um, if I might, so the fixing, the improving the governance part is, and taking a look at the holistic picture is the important bit, and that's the one that I wanted to come about, talk to with respect to this particular guidelines that uh, Hans has been talking about and the zero draft of which you see with you right now. So uh, the guidelines themselves talk about three key concepts, uh, professionalizing the state ownership, uh, making the SOEs operate as a best, you know, as if it was a good run, uh, well-run private company uh, and level playing field in terms of the competition of the private sector, that's standard stuff. It also talks about three fundamental principles which are very easy to understand separation of roles, uh, distinction between uh, its role as an owner, and it also has a role of, you know, in terms of regulatory practices, policy making, prosecutorial, and so on. And of course, the SOE should not be put at a disadvantage if it is going to be competing with the private sector, and these are all things that we understand. Right, my own observations, if I might take another five minutes just to talk a little bit about this. If you were to take a different track to this and look at it from a different perspective, I like this notion of what you know, we talk about in new institutional economics, about what are some of the things that we think about with respect to governments and how they work. Because state-owned enterprise, by definition, have the state in it. You cannot divorce 
the notion of a state and how it works and what it does from the SOE. It, you can't, and that's why this, this new institute of economics is such a, a key concept for us. Notion of information asymmetry. Look, all of us over here have access to information, but in different ways. So uh, we know more today about what happened yesterday than we will know about what's going to happen tomorrow. So there's an asymmetry of time, of information. There's a symmetry with respect to space. So if you're in Bhutan, for example, and I actually did, a, did some work with the, with the Bhutan Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, a, a company that's based in Thimpo will have access to more information just by virtue of the fact that the person is going to be involved. Let's say they might run into a minister, they might run into this, you know, the secretary in, in, the, in the department. Whereas somebody that's living in you know, some other uh, you know, uh, remote Ha, for example, there's a district called Ha. If the company is based in Ha, a remote district, the person is not going to be able to have you know, access to information that easily. So it's information asymmetry due to space. And then, very interestingly, if I were to give you a set of information now, you know, a, a balance sheet of a, country, uh, of a particular company or some story about what has happened in Venezuela, for example, you will interpret it differently. So even if you have the same access to that information, the information is still the same. Our interpretative ability is different. So information asymmetry is at the core of everything that happens. Uh, so Stiglitz, when he won the Nobel Economic Prize, actually gave a Nobel address on this particular topic of information asymmetry. It's at the core. So state-owned enterprises are also subject to information asymmetry. You have, for example, you know, a board member that comes from government and an independent board member. You would assume that the board member that comes from government has access to more information by virtue of the fact that he or she, let's say, is a secretary in the department or is uh, you know, a minister's appointee and knows and has access. So that information asymmetry point is very important. That's why the notion of bounded rationality just says that we're all limited by what we can do. So even in a board, you're going to have individuals that know more and that, you know, others that know less. Uh, there's transaction costs. I talked about this yesterday. And I think we, don't, we haven't done enough justice to the notion of transaction costs. State-owned enterprises, by virtue, of their, their, you know, by, by virtue of their definition, there's going to be a lot of transaction costs to getting things done. And if you keep on adding regulation after regulation and other such you know, measures on these SOEs, there's going to be you know, issues that are related to this. Transaction costs are important. Why does one particular firm, for example, if it has $10 million, why does it want to invest in... Singapore and not in the Philippines or not in Cambodia or not in Nepal because it believes that there are certain that the transaction costs of doing business in Singapore are lower because everything goes according to the rule of law you know so that's one of the other things that we need to remember about where the space in which SOEs work and finally I talk, the credible commitment is important because if I'm an investor if I know that the government is going to be taking a serious action and is committed to the reform that it wants to do then I will actually go ahead and you know, you know, put my, uh, my funds over there. SOEs will work in a more efficient way. And I've talked about the hard and soft consequences. This, to me, are the four overarching concepts that help me understand where SOEs fit in. And that's important because in terms of the guidelines that are there in right now, the zero draft, and, and hopefully this will, uh, and, and I think there's a revised draft that has already been uh, circulated, and, and, and this will probably come in. I did want to talk about four things and then I'll stop over there. So first of all, a PJ does talk about how it does not, the predominant, uh, sorry, the uh, guidelines have necessarily assigned one government institution to play a predominant ownership role. And if this is not in place, then it does not really affect the implementation of the recommendations. And I sort of had my doubts about it. Uh, because as we've talked about over here, uh, in some countries, you have an, uh, um, um, uh, an entity that plays a coordination role, like in, in Indonesia, for example. And in other countries, you don't have an institution like that. There are SOEs where governments have, you know, uh, they control them by virtue of just looking at one uh, ministry with respect to that particular SOE. My sense is that it will make a difference in terms of the implementation of the, um, of the work of the uh, SOEs. The second thing is uh, that we're not really taking into account the overarching national integrity system when we talk about it. Now, in the morning, I remember, uh, I think it was Patil who talked about, you need to think about the overarching in integrity system in the country because if you're looking at SOE reforms and corruption and so on, you can't look at it in terms of, in isolation. It is a part of a system, bigger system. 
And that's one of the things that when we worked on in Bangladesh, for example, in 2005, 2006, when we did the loan, this was one of the main lessons that we got out of it, that you cannot just look at an SOE in and of itself. So around 2007, we did a, I did a loan in Mizoram in India, and we worked on trying to reform some of the SOEs, closing down some of them. And it was very clear right at the beginning that you cannot just look at an SOE as an entity itself. You have to look at it as part of the bigger system. So I think the guidelines could do a little bit more with respect to looking at the national integrity system. I know they talk about them, but I think you could do more about looking at what is it that the system says and how is it structured so that the SOE anti-corruption and integrity guidelines fit in properly. I like the ex ante risk based due diligence. I thought that was a really good thing. Yesterday, when I was chairing a session, I did talk about this uh, due diligence, the, the risk, uh, risk based due diligence. The ex ante part is important. Uh, ex ante versus ex post. We have a, a, a due diligence system that is in place before anything goes wrong. Not learning from what goes wrong and then we come up with an ex post assessment of why we should have done this. But an ex ante, meaning we specify what is it that the risks could be, how is it that we'll run the due diligence, and then see how that gets uh, you know, worked out. Uh, page 19 does talk about that. I thought that was a really important point and I hope we can focus on that. And finally, um, the accountability of the state-run enterprises and the state the guidelines say that you invite civil society, public and press, and business community. And look, I come back to transaction costs. This is very good on paper. When I was teaching at the university, I would talk about all these things because it was really nice to talk about it at an academic level. It's good. But in reality, are you going to subject an SOE to be open to civil society, public and press, and business community? Have you really understood the transaction cost of what's implied over there? That to me is a very serious issue, which I think could be brought into the guidelines in a strong way. I will end over here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gambier. And uh, I take your point about information asymmetry and transaction costs. It needs to be balanced carefully. Uh, to play the devil's advocate, and this is not necessarily my position, but just I remember when I was a young, naive man in the OECD many years ago, our then chief economist had a discussion with Joe Stiglitz, and the chief economist said, yeah, but if you start arguing information asymmetry and trans transaction costs, you can say that anything is impossible. So, but just to strike the balance, and I, on the point of information asymmetry, I would say it cuts in both directions, because if it's corrupt, because the government wants it so, then it's uh, that the government representatives know things that, that the others don't. But if it is corrupt because uh, opportunistic individuals inside the SOE do whatever uh, they want, then it's, uh, the, uh, the argument cuts in the opposite direction. It's because uh, those who are responsible can't really see what's going on. But uh, enough about this. I give uh, the floor to uh, Dumber for a second presentation. Good afternoon. Uh my name is Dumber, and I come from Bhutan. We have a holding company called Druk Holding and Investment, established in 2007. And uh, SOEs, most of them are transferred to this uh, holding structure. The aim being to provide good governance and improve efficiency and productivity. That has been the aim when we started. Now, SOEs were there in Bhutan, I don't know since when. I could still remember of the days when I did a temporary job when I was in class 10. Therefore, they were there. And SOE play a very important role in Bhutan because it contributes about 25% of our GDP. And around that uh, figure in terms of employment also, and then contributes about 35% of the domestic revenue. So SOE, as Professor Mistra said, are bound to be there. Government comes and go, but it will be there. And realizing that fact, I think, improvement of the performances and the governance system in, uh, in the SOEs was realized. And it also happened that the creation of DHI was coincided with the transition political phase in Bhutan. Bhutan came to fully uh, democratic governance in uh, 2007 also. So many people say, was that the move that the state played to insulate your corporate governance or the SOE management from political interference? 
but it worked well. And I am very fortunate because I was there from that group, research team itself, coming up with some of the ideas. And we had that fear that as long as political masters do not have hands in deciding on corporate affairs, we may be better off. Because then political masters will be there for five years or some even for less than that. And then most of the resources would be used to fulfill their political agenda. They will go and promising during the campaigning, put all the people, whether skilled, non-skilled, capable, or whatever, to fill the post in uh, the SOEs, and also take a lot of fund out. That is being needed to be stopped, and I think that is one area of strength that Bhutan, like in our case, uh, were able to do it. I don't know whether it is a very good step or bad steps. We have not really done much of the studies on whether it would have been even better if they were there. But one thing that I can share with you is the Transference International's research findings in Bhutan on cor uh, corruption index used to be very high before. It used to be, uh, the score used to be less than 50, which means in a very difficult situation. But now we have improved, and in the last four or five years, we have come quite well. And this year's we are index is 67, and we rank 26th among 180 countries. In fact, rated best in South Asia. And it has been consistently being done. The improvement we see is also because the corporate governance in the SOEs were as established with the aim to set standards for the private sector. And there are few SOEs still with uh, Minister of Finance and also for bureaucracy. One agenda that we always carry when we work on ethical practice is sometimes it is the environment. This integrity is something very qualitative term, and we do not know how we measure ourselves in that scale. Most of you probably will have, when you hire your CEOs or boards, integrity remains as a very important factor, very high weightage in terms of rating when you conduct the interviews. It is very difficult to know how much we give on that. Especially in a society where there's a huge population and you don't know each other. But Bhutan, that way we have little advantages because the society is so small and we know each other very closely. Sometimes it's advantage, sometimes it's disadvantage when you come to upholding integrity also. Because in a very small society, you become very close friends. You can openly talk. If you have a interest, and if you are into the same ethical uh, compromising background. But sometimes, because you are so small, you are also known, and then we don't, uh, we avoid. So this both advantage and disadvantage is there in the, uh, whenever we talk about corruption and integrity because of the smaller in size. Um, to us, we all the time, again, we go on saying we should have a zero tolerance to corruption. And anti-corruption Bhutan goes on advocating this. I don't know what that means, because it's not as SOE or the society remains corruption also, I, in my view, probably will remain. Maybe it differs in magnitude and scale depending on countries, level, background, size, but it is there. Even today, in uh, international, uh, you know, in the rating of uh, Transparency International, the best country, like Switzerland, New Zealand, Singapore, they are somewhere around 81, 82. If it was no corruption, then it would have been 100. Therefore, it is going to be there to some extent because we are all diverse and some will be there, we will practice that. The only effort in Bhutan that we are moving towards is come up with a guideline and systems and a culture of integrity and accountability systems such that most of the people will practice it or follow it most of the time.
still cannot rule out. Few of the people will practice the other way few of the times. It is still acceptable, but only thing is we need to be improving in this front. For us, or anybody to that matter, prevention of corruption and enhancing integrity will have to be understood in a context that corruption, like in SOE's literature also, we say is the antithesis to corporate governance. It is opposite of the corporate governance, or uh, you, we can also say it is explained or determined by the factor of bad corporate governance. If we have bad corporate governance, then some corruption will be there. Therefore, we will have to strengthen the overall corporate governance systems and procedures itself if we need to reduce corruption. Or if you want to reduce corruption in SOEs, the SOEs governance will have to be improved. We have spent some time in, like in the history of what, now 10, 11 years, very seriously in terms of improving the corporate governance, followed OECD guideline, did not adopt everything, but adapted to our own culture so that it also has to be sold in your own culture. Even if you have to change the package, it needs to be because it has to be sold or there must be buy-in. Especially for those who are advocating good corporate governance, that also coming later on and joining the uh, system becomes difficult. There will be a lot of resistance. Therefore, Bhutan's development philosophy that also is embodying a lot of uh, these uh, corporate governance characteristics is brought in into the OECD guidelines to develop our corporate governance systems. And our development philosophy says that everyone should be happy. And to be happy, there must be economic development without compromises on your societal values or societal ethics, without compromising on your uh, environment. And it has to be done based on the very good governance, which when we are talking about those three P's or the bottom lines, these were being built and now we are trying to adjust with the corporate governance system somewhere and trying to say this is what very much alike our own development philosophy. So it becomes very easy to sell the OECD guidelines in our system. Otherwise, for a small country like ours, especially for uh, developing countries, sometimes anything that is borrowed is good. Sometimes uh, something that we borrow from here is seen as we are in a different cultural context. Therefore, it cannot be used. So we just wanted to make sure that those kind of resistance do not happen. Therefore, and involving everybody from the grassroots level, especially in the SOEs, was also must in terms of developing a, uh, corporate governance procedures. We see a good corporate governance is one of the most important ways of fighting corruption and holding up business values also. Now, in doing that, everybody was, uh, in the morning, we talked about tone at the top. Well, then, in a company is the board who governs the company and also hires you and sets a strategic plan. Therefore, if we have appoint political appointees, or somebody who is being already identified by someone, sometimes it becomes very difficult also because we had experienced that before 2008 anyway. And there is a very rigorous system of electing directors through the guidelines that we have developed. It takes a lot of time because if uh, 
a director is resigning or term is getting over in six months, we start from now itself. And there's a specific thing doing all the due diligence, identifying based on the professional background, the experience, industry background, nominee, all those, everything we do it. The only thing, of course, the nominee directors play a very important role in terms of helping reducing corruption in the board. But in a small society like ours, having independent director is also very difficult. Therefore, we tend to compromise on the definition ourselves. It has to be the independence in mind rather than fulfilling the definition. Of course, we try to find some from the market here and there. It is very difficult. And we make these people attend independent directors training program most of the time so that they become independent at least in thinking in the boardroom. And uh, we always feel the capacity of, capacity development of the director is very crucial in order to understand the business values and not letting the management compromise on the business ethic just based on what is prevailing in the market because they have to compete with the private sector where there can be a lot of uh, underground transactions. And to do that for a small country to inbuild or inculcate this kind of good practices and business values, we always depend on this kind of network, talk to people, based on our understanding of the people, then we request them to help us. And we have, through this network, done a lot of things. And we have a lot of uh, professionals, including ICD in Philippines, then ICD in Malaysia, so many countries that we are working relationship in helping and building capacity development for our directors and inculcating these values. And it is that in the guideline, I also would say we have to emphasize very strongly on independent internal auditors. Today, the CEOs still feel that in the internal auditors is a management uh, tools which will help them in studying or developing answers to the memos raised by the external auditors. It happened like that. Now gradually we are successful now of taking them away from the grips of the CEOs so that they report and also plan their work directly with the board audit committee and the clear charter for them is very much essential. Otherwise, even if some corruption happens in the organizations, and if CEO would like to camouflage, he would use the internal auditor. That was some kind of experiences that we had in the beginning. Then the other one that we also realized, if we need to improve uh, on this front, of course, we sell, like Dr. Misra said yesterday, Whistleblower's policy, policy, but does the whistle blow? Sometimes it blows too many times, and we don't have time to attend this. I feel sorry for my colleague here, Fub, who is here, who looks after this whistleblowing group, because we have also started something called corruption complaints related to corruptions or any integrity ethics or whatever. Anybody, employees or public or customers, can provide feedback in different forms. Either with names, without names, online or written, in whatever form they can send. And every two, three weeks, when it becomes a little bit thick, then we sit down and start looking at it. And then we say, some of them are just expression of frustration, we sideline that. Because we won't have time to go through all that. But certain areas where we feel is worth visiting, then we send an investigation team also silently. But before we start investigating, we gather, do some due diligence 
or we send, give it to the board directors, audit, board audit committee to look into it. Serious ones, we also cooperate with anti-corruption commission because we provide ourselves the feedback. And in terms of uh, we being very serious about uh, improving system, anti-corruption Bhutan very closely works with us and we have signed an integrity pact with them and they have around 18 to 19 factors on assessing the integrity level of our companies and 18 companies, no, 14 companies have already signed the pact. They have already started doing the assessment and the integrity indicators or the factors, the basis that they talk is also very similar to what uh, OECD is working on right now. They are also talking about the systems and procedures, culture, which means non-acceptance in the society for a, a non-ethical person, and also accountability. How, what should we do in terms of putting people accountable for the actions, and what steps would be there, guidelines would be there, in order to assess that. We have several kind of guidelines and all that. I will circulate the uh, PowerPoint to you because I just didn't want to do it because sometimes we look at the PowerPoint more than the speaker. So I just wanted to avoid that. But this will be available to you with all the guidelines and procedures that we have developed. I'll share with you. And the other one is the performance management. It's very important in terms of reducing that. We also have corruption and audit related factors put in for about 10% in the overall uh, enterprise level assessment. And that also helps. And with this, I would like to stop it here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tampara. That was an interesting presentation. And uh, I, I'm sure we are all grateful for your kind words about the network and how that has assisted your national um, reform efforts. I, I hope that our main sponsors heard you say that. <laughs> I, um, uh, on a more serious uh, note, I, uh, I thank you for linking the issue of anti-corruption into corporate governance. Uh, the OECD would certainly agree with you that corruption is antithesis to good corporate governance because uh, uh, if you have good corporate governance, then you have transparency in the company, but transparency basically precludes that you allow corruption and then if you have good corporate governance and you have good incentives for clever and hardworking people, whereas if you allow corruption, then you'll soon find that you're rewarding crooks instead of, instead of hardworking people. So uh, <laughs> thanks for that observation. We, we have reached, in theory, the limit, but we started 30 uh, minutes late, so I will allow myself to um, open the floor for at least 10, 15 minutes if people have comments or, or questions. And, Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Jeffrey Sreger from Indonesia. I would like to ask Mr. Hans about, as we all know and aware, ISO has already published ISO 37001 about anti-bribery management system. So I would like to ask the standing point of this uh, upcoming guidelines about uh, from OECD. And I think there might be some effort to adopt or maybe absorb uh, precisely the principles that already in ISO so we could, we could synergize and harmonize these uh, upcoming uh, principles to the uh, previous ISO 37001. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, this is uh, something that we should be looking into. I, I, my proviso is, of course, that um, the guidelines are placed close to a best practice model, kind of where you emulate SOEs on, um, on best practices of listed companies, and ISO is very procedurally based, so the gut feeling of many of our members would be, say, but yeah, okay, fine, that's maybe a good idea, but that's for the board of directors to uh, kind of uh, to deal with. But I agree with you that essential parts of that instrument should be put into the package that the government owners communicate to the SOEs uh, as part of their expectations. Thank you. I think I have, uh, I would request Hans, whether you have taken a 360 degree look at, you know, the paper that you have prepared. The observation there is 
and that you think that when a whistle is blown, everything is there within the enterprise. But that's not the case. I give you what happens in India. That can be challenged in the junior court, can be the challenge in the high court, can go even to Supreme Court. So at times, I think, the person who blows the whistle, as Damber told, he's whistled out. So what do we do about, you know, uh, what do we do in such a case? That's one. Number two, when we talk of this, and you have been talking, I think, you know, at different fora, we must think of a level playing field. Unless we have a level playing field, then we can say that the path of uh, rooting out anti uh, bribery and corruption is a righteous path. But also see how people can walk the path. And there, I think, unless level playing field is there, it may not be a fully level playing field, but there must be some justice between public sector and private sector. Now, another very important observation you know, is about uh, Dr. Uh, Bhatta. Now, he talked about, you know, we talked of, you know, illicit financial flows. Now, this is a very interesting concept, but you see in number of countries around the world, we have got the system of P notes, participatory notes. And these participatory notes, they come from different, you know, financial institutions. And their even names are not disclosed. Now that money is a corrupt money. When that corrupt money comes to the government, and government invests 10%, 20%, or 30%, then what happens? The genes of corruption, DNA of, DNA of corruption, it goes, I think, from the government to the enterprise. How do you stop that? And then, again, the concept of people at the top. We talked of tone at the top. It's a good, I think, you know, uh, idiom or phrase. But the question is that do we see who is at the top? Do we see beyond the wall? Do you think the CEO is at the top? Do you think the minister is at the top? Do you think the parliament is at the top? Do you think the prime minister is at the top? What is the concept of top? So we, we must, I think, you know, we must look into these things and then come to, uh, you know, something, you know, which can really be practiced and we take baby steps. Unless we understand that, then we just can't hold the CEO responsible. He is, I don't think, in many countries, CEO is not at the top. CEO, I think, can be, you know, can be, you know, his position can always be shaken, I think. I wonder whether the panel might want to respond to, to the last point. Uh, I, um, I don't see any, I mean, it was a fiery kind of intervention that we, uh, we, we all appreciate. I, I would like to return to the point about um, whistleblowing. I mean, if I stay closely to OECD's incumbent instruments, I would have to provide a very uh, limited uh, response, since that goes back to the G20 OECD principles, which say that we don't condone necessarily whistleblowing out in the public space, but rather bona fide reports to the board of directors. But that's then conditional on the idea that you have these strong independent boards of directors without uh, government interference, which may in many cases be a pipe dream, uh, which is one reason why in the draft ACI guidelines uh, we have this provision about the press and civil society because that's then really the overflow channel where uh, where you can gain some publicity and some public outrage around practices that there's an unwillingness to deal with within the uh, incumbent political system. Uh, Professor Mr. one interesting thing on whistleblowing. So many whistles were blown in a small country like ours, but one was very strong. And it was in the financial institutions and it was, he was CFO who was rated as very high by the board, very hardworking, later on found some fund being siphoned very creatively. And even auditors, accountants, rest didn't find. It was the whistle that found. And then, of course, we may have spent a lot of time, but one fish was caught. That was hiding. <laughs> Sometimes it is useful, but how much time would you spend and wait with your hook like this, you know, and every time you take it out and throw it away. But one day you'll get a big one also who had been very notorious. And then that time we thought, oh, it is useful. But other times when you have to spend the group and every time you sit down, it says you feel very tired also. 
like so many things in uh, economics, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Any last questions, comments from the floor? I see. Uh, yeah. I am Dr. Rat. Actually, my, I was a chief vigilance officer uh, in India some time back in a Ministry of Defense, PSU, SOE. My personal experience, uh, we got the CEO sacked, but it took a long time. In India, the problem is so many 5Cs, you know, yesterday somebody told CBC, CIC, CBI, CAG. But the problem in India, in SOG, this is very, very long drawn process. So by the time the CEO or any board members is getting sacked, uh, he already, you know, uh, lost his tenure. Or uh, my personal experience is even the CBO, I was a chief business officer of uh, Defense Ministry and getting outstanding rating from CBC, but CBO is attacked. The problem is in Indian society, the ethics is so poor in some case. If the chief vigilance department also is attacked by political masters. So I don't know how OECD or any guidelines should do in a democratic system. This is ingrained, like in Bhutan. You may be the best happiness, no? Uh, index, all the things. But the uh, thing is, because it's a small country, you know, it is maybe transparent, maybe minus point. So my submission to is my personal experience. Even if you got the CEO sacked, but it takes a lot of time in India for which uh, we suffer, the society suffers. Thank you. Uh, on that particular point, and with, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Kaka will be better able to talk about it, but um, if you look at, uh, if you talk about a small country, there are issues that are difficult being small as well, because I remember having long conversations with the former chair of the Anti-Corruption Commission, and she would actually say, it's really hard in Bhutan because everybody knows everybody else. How are you going to actually sit down and investigate your own distant uncle, for example? And uh, there was a time when the, the ACC actually wrote a very scathing uh, um, uh, report about the ex-prime minister, if you remember, in the land scandal, Galfon case. And she said, uh, how was she knew this person very well. She worked with the person, and yet you're supposed to sit down and investigate and actually, you know, cite, uh, I guess this is a really difficult thing for a small country. So can we all understand the difficulties that Bhutan has uh, with this, uh, this respect? It's much easier when you have a bigger country and all that. But I think it sort of goes down to the value system that you have in, in the country. And when I worked in New Zealand, that came out very clear. Uh, and in Singapore, of course, that's a different kettle of fish altogether. There are very strong rules there. Yes, as Dr. Watt said, it is difficult even in small societies. It is easy to know what is happening. Because even the neighbors start talking, there's a few things that they do, because they know to the extent of how much you get every month, and what you are doing, how much you are spending every month. Because in a small society, we also become a very good accountant of our neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Unpaid though. But yet, when it comes down to taking actions, and it becomes difficult because you know each other very well. And it is also, Equally, very risky because when you are sitting on a re recruitment panel, you may start getting calls because you know each other. So there are a lot of difficulties also. However, it is also the system. Sometimes if you, it is also the system that if you insulate certain things, you may be able to work independently. At least we do not get any calls from any of the political masters which is more difficult, you know, because that is so, so well uh, insulated by His Majesty the King himself, foreseeing these problems may come up, and said everything DHI will decide on this front. Nobody, not even the Prime Minister, will have access to the resources on his own. It's well less, and then you can do something. It is the system that may help you. Otherwise, in a small society, difficult. Okay, I, I will allow one last question, a comment, and then we'll have to wrap this up. Is there any last uh, person would like to say? No, apparently not. Well, then in that case, let me just say by ways of uh, conclusion here that uh, we have heard in this room a lot of uh, support for, the, for further work uh, towards addressing 
corrupt practice, irregular practices and state-owned enterprises and a consensus, I think, which I welcome, that uh, it has to start with good ownership and governance, uh, corporate governance practices, and the rest then comes down from that. Even um, you are a Bhutanese example, I would uh, say that it really starts with commitment. I mean, these much vaulted independent central banks in Europe, uh, they are independent because governments having the powers that they have, want them to be independent. And uh, your system works because there's a commitment at the top to make it work. Yeah. And similarly, I mean, the, the muted skepticism that was voiced about yet another set of guidelines. Uh, of course, our guidelines cannot save the world. Uh, all that we can do is propose them to policymakers uh, like your government and then hope that some of them will express a commitment to the good practices that we put forward. Um, and uh, going from here, uh, and uh, I say this could be a topic for uh, a more in-depth discussion at a later uh, network meeting, if, if you ask me, but uh, going forward from here and checking this back to the OECD processes, um, the, um, uh, what happens next is that we are still in a drafting mode of these ACI guidelines until um, early uh, October. So any uh, written comments and suggestions you have will be uh, very much welcomed by the OECD Secretariat. And also uh, keeping in mind that our working party on state ownership and privatization practices is quite generous with its invitations to non-member countries. So should any of you wish to participate in the discussions in Paris on the 14th and 15th of November, you are cordially welcome. Uh, I mean, there's uh, a process, uh, but uh, you are welcome to let us know and we shall do the, uh, whatever is ne necessary. So with that, uh, I would like you to um, give a hand to thank uh, our panel and uh, thank you very much for this interesting last session. <laughs>